Welcome Great. everybody and I'm handing over to Marlene. Thank you. Hi, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I understand it's the third Dacha webinar. I watched the first and the second yesterday, actually. <laughs> actually, I listened to them in the car, so I'm not sure if that counts, but it was very interesting. Um, just some of the housekeeping is about just keeping your video and mic switched off during the presentation um, and ask questions and comments, please write them in the chat or make some notes and you can voice them yourself. Um, it's really important for me because I haven't presented a panel discussion before and I can't cope with silence at the end that I might potentially have to fill. So think of questions, that'd be great. Um, so just introducing myself, um, oh, and just to clarify that the recordings will be sent to everybody that's here today. So um, you'll have a copy of the slides and all those things too. Um, I have to apologize if I get anybody's name wrong or if I don't use the correct research terms because they're not familiar to me. So I'm not sure that, and I'm just not very good with names. So they're all things that you'll have to accept, unfortunately. Um, so my name is Marlene Kelly. I'm a registered manager at a care home that's based in Watford. I've been in position for 17 years. Um, I um, love being a registered manager. It's a really amazing role. I'm a director for the organisation I work for too. And at the moment, I give three days to that position. Um, my life experience is that um, my mum lived with dementia. She passed away last year and she'd had a dementia diagnosis for eight years. So that probably taught me more than my 17 years experience as a registered manager, but it was all very useful. Um, and so my involvement with Dacha is that I was invited to join the PPIE as a group member. Um, and it's been a really brilliant experience and that's probably because of Anne, but it, it's just been done really well. So as a non-academic, non-researcher, then the whole process, I felt like I have something to contribute and the my opinions and my experience has been really valued. And that's very different to my experience as a token person from social care which I've experienced before in health and in research. So it just feels so different. And because of that, and because of the encouragement, I went on to be a co-applicant on the Chappie project, which the Chappie project is looking at people living in care homes, becoming part of the PPIE groups and having more involvement and more say in what research is done. So, and that's something I feel quite passionate about. Um, and then, as Claire said, I had the opportunity to publish something um, from my experiences around Dacha, and that was with a, um, another person, Emily, that was on the group. And it was just something that we thought it would be really interesting for registered managers and people that work in social care to know that there is a way into research, because that isn't made obvious to us, and it doesn't feel like an open door, but actually, you know, for me, the process has been great and I've learned so much. So, so we just wanted to publicize that to others. And I think that's now in the chat. So um, the only other thing like that I just wanted to mention is that I'm doing some work now for impact just two days a week for 12 months. And that's on um, encouraging men into social care. And I've also had the confidence to apply for a fellowship and these are all things that never would have happened. Like I, I presented to parliament during the pandemic and Claire contacted me after and said, oh, you know, would you be interested in doing this? And Anne's been so encouraging. So through this process, then one thing's led to another and it's sort of carving this interesting path out for me. And I just want to encourage others that might not have considered it as a, interesting future then actually there's a lot we can do together and I'm really passionate about making things better for the people we support I'm really passionate about people in social care offering something to researchers and academics and vice versa because I'm learning so much and hopefully they're learning something too which is great so Dacha, I'm sure I don't need to explain to any of you, but I'm just going to say that it's a four-year study. It was funded by the 
N-I-H-R, which is really hard for me to say for some reason, and led by Professor, Professor Goodman, Claire Goodman. Um, and the study is looking at a minimum data set for care homes. And the study started before the pandemic when data was very uncool and, and care homes were very uncool. And then the pandemic happened and then suddenly we were in desperate need of that data. And then DATCHA got rockstar research status immediately because it was something that everybody realised we really did need to look at. Um, so the focus of the study, for me, my experience has been, it's always been about the people that are living in care homes and working in care homes have always been at the centre of the study. And I don't know research, so I don't know if that's always the case. But I know that in every meeting, we're reminding each other of that. And I think that's really important. So today's panel um, is great and includes um, Jenny Burton, who unfortunately is covering the wards today. So Claire is going to present her slides and her contribution on her behalf. We've got um, Barbara Hennity, sorry, Hen and Henrati, sorry, from Newcastle University speaking about the National Survey and the Dutcher Domiciliary Care Study. And finally, Anne-Marie Towers from Kent University speaking about quality of life measures. Um, and at the end of all three presentations, we'll have time for questions. So first, it's going to be Claire that I'm going to introduce, and she is going to cover for Jenny. Okay, so thank you so much. Jenny is a geriatrician and uh, COVID has hit and so she's had to cut, she has to go to, had to, go to the ward. So here's, what she has sent is a, is a recorded presentation of her slides, but unfortunately the sound didn't, hasn't been clear. So I'm slightly going to be a second guess as to what is going to come, but Jenny, um, all three presentations today are really a reflection of the development of Dacha and what became very apparent very early on was lots of people thought they knew what a minimum data set was and had very different views um, as to what it should contain. And so Jenny led this really important work to help the team, never mind the wider audience, and agree, okay, so what is a minimum data set and what are the key principles that we would want to see informing it? Um, so this here slide is really just a summary of all the different sources of data and where it comes from and who looks at it. So this is for the, most of the people on this webinar, this will not be surprising, but I think for some policymakers, it has been in terms of, you know, the, at the resident level of care, at the care home level of care, but also addressing all the needs of the regulator and also ensuring that the environment um, that people are living in, that you've got the information as to how that is working in terms of support and numbers for workforce and so on and so forth. Um, and that absolutely escalated during the pandemic and exposed how all this information is held by different groups um, and in different places. And at the height of the pandemic, the ONS, suddenly the Office of National Statistics became a major source of information um, on mortality because um, it wasn't held consistently anywhere else, which as we know, as we see the inquiry, um, was deeply problematic. Um, so, and an awful lot of the responsibility for data capture relies on care homes, um, who, as we know already, um, are under huge pressures to be able to mobilize care and often see the data capture elements as a distraction from the care. So this is what these principles are trying to address. And as Marlene was saying, is trying to acknowledge that what matters is um, how that data is used um, by the people who provide the care, but also, as this slide shows, can meet the needs of um, family and friends who want to know what's happening, the visiting healthcare team, integrated care systems, the integrated care um, boards that bring together health and social care data, the regulator, care representative bodies also want to be able to mobilize this data, not least to demonstrate the, the range and depth of provision, 
national government want it, statistics providers and researchers need it, and also wider society. And very often it is a recognition that depending on how this data is used is deeply influential. So this is the first principle that any minimum data set must primarily focus on measuring what matters most to support those living in care homes through systematic data collection and sharing. So that principle is saying, making some very key messages about it has to be systematic, it can't be just what anybody thinks matters, but it has to answer that question. Does it matter most to those who are living in care homes? And you'd think that was obvious, but I think for those of us who have a healthcare research background, we recognize that very often it's about the uh, pressures placed on the NHS that moves to the top of the agenda. And that isn't really the core business uh, for care homes. So that's principle one. And what I should say is we've used these principles to decide what has gone into the minimum data set that um, Datcher has developed and is now prototype. It must be evidence-based in design and the contents require co-production with key stakeholders. Now, again, this is really interesting. You'd think that would be really obvious. Oh, and we've gone, okay. Here's a we. All right. Nope. Um, I don't know what why he stopped sharing. Sorry. One... <laughs> it just wouldn't be a webinar without something going wildly wrong. We've not. We've never. Oh, anyway, anyway, you don't want to hear what other people have gone through. Right. Okay. Evidence based, requiring co-production. So, and I think you know there are a lot of evidence based measures out there, and those of you who've been on the journey of Datcha with us, you'll know that first review that identified so many assessment and outcome measures that are used in care homes. Um, not all of them are useful uh, or usable within care homes. So that requires the involvement of different people, both care home staff, but also people who use that data and asking them what matters. And Anne-Marie's presentation is gonna reflect that because one of the big messages that came out of early work was the quality of life. Um, but whilst everybody records something about this, it's not evidence-based. Must reduce data burden and duplication of effort. So this is one of the work that Datcher is doing, is establishing where pieces of information sit and also where they duplicate. So a lot of databases, for example, record information about people's ethnicity. Um, and one of the things that we are doing is looking to see, well, which is the measure that's most useful, and we will use that. And it's quite likely that we won't be asking care homes to record that data because it's sitting in GP data. Um, and therefore, we and that's the pilot in collaboration and ongoing engagement. So this is the principle of reducing data burden. And one of the challenges of the minute we have a minimum data set is people want to add to it. And say, oh, could you just slip in this measure because we'd like to know? And that's quite a difficulty uh, to keep the minimum um, active and moving so that you're not um, that missing feet, if you like. Um, I'm waiting for principle four. Please do put comments in the chat because um, uh, I think we will. Be... So, principle four that it will be underpinned by digital care planning and care record systems. Now this reflects the very rapid digitalization agenda. And while we're still in a situation where the percentage of care homes that rely on paper records or hybrid mix of uh, uh, paper records and online recording is still very much the dominant experience, it, this, we are saying that this is not going to be the situation five years from now and therefore we are not supporting or looking at a minimum data set that would be uh, would require any paper completion. But the big message there back to our policymakers is you cannot achieve this without digital infrastructure and investment. And our realist review really underlined that if you want to implement a minimum data set effectively, you have to address not only the infrastructure, but investment and enabling staff to use the minimum data set well which goes beyond just being able to enter data, which is really not the implementation. It's to enter data so that you know that it then can feed back into how you make decisions about care. Now, again, it's I still reiterate, we had to work through these principles to inform 
um, the Dacha minimum data set. But when we came together originally as a team, we hadn't really thought we had, I think it had been implicit, we thought we all knew what a minimum data set was. And it was only when we were discussing what should be go in and how we should decide that these principles became key. Can you nudge us on to the next one, please, if possible? I obviously talk faster than Jenny does. So again, the minimum data set will inf information on the care home service and information on the model of staffing that supports them. So what, now this is the, probably one of, I don't think understanding the model of staffing and linking it to care home residents is controversial, but it is incredibly difficult. Um, but what has been difficult in explaining the um, minimum data set to uh, colleagues has been that we can't, we're not recording data on day to day care. This isn't a social uh, record of the actual care delivered, but it's key points that we're interested in. And that's to keep it concise, but making sure that we have measures that would reflect the process of care, even though it's not actually measuring, for example, what people eat every day. Minimum data set brings together from data within the care home coupled with data held externally. And that will be something that we will be presenting on in our webinar in the new year of where we are linking the data held from care homes with routine data held in um, GP records, in hospital records, and in social care records. Um, I think that fits completely with what in England integrated care systems are, are trying to do and there's a lot of learning about what you need to have in place. So this is the slide that summarizes all the different data sources that will go into the minimum data set. And again, you can see there is an extensive um, portfolio of data that is out there. And the challenge that we face um, in Dacha study is how we systematically collect it and also standardize the, the derived variables from all those different sources. And that's what um, colleagues in Kent and at the Health Foundation are addressing as we speak. Um, but again, I think Jenny has put a heart in the middle of that home icon. It is always about, is this useful and usable to those who are working in and with care homes, but also can it address the needs and expectations of the external people who absolutely need to understand this population. So I can pause while people look at that. Can we go on a little bit to guess? Can we start? Nope. So data sharing must have an agreed purpose. Data sharing pathways must be defined and formalized in data sharing agreements using secure environments for access where appropriate. Care home residents' privacy rights must be protected. Now that's actually is probably something, and it's a shame that Jenny isn't able to present this because drawing on her experience in Scotland where there have been um, census of care homes, she has observed and commented on how data is shared and who with and when has unintended consequences um, and who owns the data once it has been aggregated and brought together absolutely needs to be discussed. And I know if Liz Jones were here from National Care Forum, she would, this is a very active issue of concern for those working in social care. And this flows on to the need to support and access to use the data they collect and share using electronic dashboards. So it is that core assumption that no data that care homes are collecting just disappears and is never seen again. And I think we learned from the pandemic that care homes absolutely stepped up and completed a lot of demands for information about their residents. Um, and that the learning from that has increased, uh, they carried on post pandemic. But I think there have been concerns about how people have been incentivized to share that information and crucially how have you been fed back both to care homes and to the people they work with. 
and principle nine was that we require a national infrastructure with an integration with existing data systems, which again, if you come to the webinar in the new year, you'll find that that's actually not as straightforward as you might have hoped. So consensus, we need to address the UK data home gap. How this rule is realized will alter the utility of the data and its potential to bring about meaningful change. So if it's just about using information to help the NHS, then we would say that would not be uh, adhering to the principles here. We need to keep residents and staff at the heart of these change, but streamlining and interoperability are key. And as you're going to hear from Barbara, it's not that we lack information, but it's key to how we organize it, use it and share it. And this um, publication on the right is um, something that Datcha contributed to. Um, we'll put the link in the chat, Smarter Data, Better Homes. And this was a really a day where of policy briefing where um, there were researchers presenting where minimum data sets are an established part in Canada particularly, but on other places, um, and just reflecting back on the recommendations of um, what needs to be, and some of the debate there extended this work. So if we go to the next slide, thanks. I think that should be emphasizing that everything you've heard is um, our opinion and not that of the uh, Department of Health or, and Social Care or the National Institute for Health and Care and Research. And just to underline that everything that you're hearing presented today is uh, because of the huge team and cooperation that DATCHA represents. Please do put questions and comments in the chat and we'll pick them up in the panel discussion after. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, I think that it's useful information. And for me, one of the things is that as a care home manager, we give out an awful lot of information, but we don't always receive a lot of information that's very useful back or sometimes any information back at all. So for me, that point is, you know, something that I've talked about a lot because we 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 just don't get the feedback and we don't get to use it for benchmarks which would be really useful to us for sure so um moving on to our second speaker which is barbara who is a professor of primary care and public health at the university of newcastle she's a director of the nihr healthy aging policy research unit and research theme lead for multimorbidity and Aging and Frailty in the Northeast and North Cumbria Applied Research Collaboration. Her research is focused on older adults, particularly in health and social care interface. Her interest in equalities and work as a GP led her to care home research, but most of her insights come from having a parent who was a resident in a care home. Barbara. Thanks, Marlene. Uh, I hope my slides are visible. Um, great, well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna spend about the next 10 minutes or so sharing some of the findings and reflections um, of data collection in care homes and home care um, that we've acquired during the journey that Dacha has been. I would like to emphasize this has very much been a team affair and particularly the Dutch Dom team who are Vanessa Davey and Jenny Little from Newcastle University, Bryony Beresford and Jan Healy at the University of York. So as Marlene said in her introduction, um, COVID-19 really brought to the fore the absence of an accessible aggregate data set in the care sector and it would have been so valuable at that time. The, the Dacha team has been interested in the concept of a minimum data set in care homes for much longer than that. Um, and it was a marriage of the two that has really um, given us a bit of a boost and, and, and also the hope that we're actually going to be doing some research that might be useful. Currently, um, recent mapping has shown there, there are more than 50 different types of data collection at a national level in social care. And that's from a sector that continues to be under immense pressures. Um, the Department of Health and Social Care has an ambitious agenda for 
rapid digitalization of social care. And if you look at the timeline that they've recently published earlier this year in their Care Data Mappers, Care Data Matters, a roadmap for better data from adult social care. Um, this goes from 2023 to 2028, and you get an idea of the ambition. So we're going from local authorities submitting quarterly um, individual client level data right through to 2028, when the aspiration would be that all care providers are using digital social care records and that data collection will be as streamlined as it's possible to be. So a huge amount of activity planned over the next few years. When we started the Duchess study, we knew that data was being collected in care homes, but we didn't have much sense of, um, at a national level, of um, what the picture was. So we set out just to ask them and we did a survey, unfortunately, during COVID, but we were grateful to have 273 responses to an online survey of care home particularly care home managers, and they represented organisations with around about 5,000 homes. Um, comparison with the National Care Quality Commission data showed that our respondents were more likely to be from larger homes and those with nursing beds, and the not-for-profits and homes with the higher um, CQC ratings were overrepresented. So care homes know their residents. Well, we knew that, but actually care homes also have an awful lot of information about their residents. Um, they have a great deal of data on the individual characteristics and behaviours. Um, data collections a little more limited where um, there may be sensitivities such as substance use and alcohol, sexuality, gender identity. But when it comes to the sorts of data that you might need to hone your care, um, what people's preferences are, all about their activities, what are their functioning, um, their healthcare contacts, then it's very comprehensive um, data collection already in progress. We were surprised that, that there was so many clinical, uh, so much clinical measurement going on because fewer than half of our respondents um, were nursing homes, um, but regular collection of blood pressure, temperature, um, urine dipsticks, etc., um, was reported from our respondents. And the range of clinical measures and tools that were in use was also a surprise. So stool charts, pain scales, very commonly used, less often measures of mental health or quality of life. So what our survey told us, and it's now it's published in the Journal of Long Term Care, um, there's a lot of data in there and a number of supplementary files. So if, if you're interested, please do have a look. It, it blew out of the water any idea that there's no data in, in, in the care home sector. Um, there is there are a lot of clinical measures being used that have been um, adopted from healthcare and often from hospital use and they're in common use. The care homes told us that they're using their data um, for monitoring care quality, looking at staff training needs, medication use, as well as for budgeting and marketing. They were generally receptive to the idea of contributing to a minimum data set, but um, were wary of privacy and data protection concerns. So our conclusion from this early piece of work was that any development of an MDS should focus on repurposing existing data because the data are being collected already and it's not about burdening care homes with extensive additional data collection. So this got us thinking while we, while we were busy with Datcha, whether we should also be thinking about a minimum data set for home care. Lots of reasons why that might be a good thing. Um, information to um, make um, service commissioning and delivery easier, workforce planning, you know, an opportunity to quality, benchmark, or um, perhaps more importantly, if we had a population level data set on people's needs and um, the care that they're receiving in the home care population, we'd be able to do things like look and see whose care needs are likely to be intensifying and could we intervene to maybe slow down that intensification and maybe postpone the need for more 
um, home care or even for postpone that need for residential care. So just a, a moment to mention what we mean by home care, because it does mean different things to different people. In this study, we're talking about the services that um, allow people to stay at home and live independently for longer when they have um, physical, mental or cognitive impairments. So that's usually support directly in someone's own, own home. It's intermittently through the day, although it can be 24 hour care, and it generally includes personal care as a paid for service. So we're not talking about support provided by friends and family, and it's a service that's subject to regulation. In England, um, home care um, clients um, outnumber care home residents by about two to one. So there's almost a million care recipients. And the sector is um, made up of almost 11,000 different care provider organisations, majority um, private for profit. Um, care staff almost never out of the news and this week is no exception despite it being a skilled occupation there's no minimum entry qualifications they're regularly in the lowest quintile of earners and a high proportion often on zero hours contracts so it's a complex um, sector um, but we approached the NHR to um, for funding for a study within a study so this, we've named it the nicknamed it the Dutcher Dom study. It's nested within Dutcher. It's a piece of exploratory work just to look at the feasibility of applying this concept of having a minimum data set to home care. And we surveyed home care providers, did interviews with um, relevant stakeholders, and um, a, did a scoping review of the international literature on MDS in home care. So our survey of home care providers was really asking about the data that they currently collect and about the, their readiness to implement an MDS if one was to be introduced. We had 155 respondents. Um, and again, this is a sector that's under huge pressure. So we, we, we weren't disappointed with that. The majority were single organizations operating in one region of England and um, almost all providing daily home social care, and around about a third um, providing other services such as reablement. The information that was collected was focused really about um, around the sorts of things they needed to know to provide care, so health conditions, impairments, um, etc. The use of standard measurement tools was much um, less frequent than it was in care homes around about half of our uh, respondents we were using predominantly um, digital um, records. And there was a plethora of different software systems. We counted 54 amongst our respondents. Again, there was qualified support for the concept of an MDS um, and similar concerns around resources, staff time, privacy, um, and particularly software costs. So our next piece of work, having um, established a little bit of a baseline, was to interview um, care providers, commissioners, clients and family. Um, care providers um, were supportive of the digital ag agenda, but didn't necessarily think it was the most pressing issue that they had to deal with. Um, and certainly there's some concern that they had been developing and transforming um, towards the digital for years and that had been overlooked, but their, their status as a private industry actually was hampering their uh, ability to influence. So commissioners had a range of um, aspirations um, for the use of an MDS that ranged from tracking care journeys over time um, to understanding the relationship between care needs and services providers, services provided, being able to look at provider characteristics, um, linking with other data sources such as from the NHS, and generally filling in those gaps in their current intelligence that would allow them to commission better and, as they put it, manage the market. Um, interestingly, commissioners expressed concerns about the impact that it would have on the home care sector given the um, potential cultural shifts 
required, the um, transient nature of the workforce, maybe they would need upskilling um, and um, would possibly need um, digital and language skills that they didn't currently have. I'm not going to say anything about clients and families at this stage because that data is still being um, analysed and I don't want to misrepresent it. So our home care study is it's still ongoing. Where, um, I think I'd summarise by saying we've got qualified support with um, caveats around the resources required a strong feeling that digitalization is only part of the process and um, bringing about practice level change is complex, protracted, and will need um, huge inputs from a range of different sources. It's a heterogeneous industry and providers vary hugely in their level of digitalization, their, their um, workforce, their, the way that they operate and, and trying to bring all of those different organisations to the same endpoint, it's going to be hugely challenging. And taking into account the context of these often smaller organisations, many loan workers, um, a varied client base, um, it's going to be vital to be sensitive to that um, setting as change is introduced. So this work has really um, Post more questions than it's answered so far. I'm just going to leave you with a few um, that have struck me particularly. Firstly, um, in any major change that would be represented by the introduction of a minimum data set and the digitalization of services, voices of care recipients and families should be central. And that's going to be very difficult, I think particularly for home care, um, where finding a united voice from care recipients or care providers is, is tricky because it's such a huge and complex area. For me, the um, many of the minimum data sets that are used across the wor world have had a strong influence from the health sector. And we're talking about people who are in their own homes, whether it's an independent house or um, a care home. I think it's vital that any translation of healthcare tools to the um, care home or home care sector is appropriate. We need to retain both the social and also the home um, in any development of a minimum data set. The size of the task is um, huge and any um, development of something like an MDS has to be compatible with the business models um, and um, there's various ways have been found across the world of, of managing that and, and I think we have to find the right way forward for England and the UK. Um, finally, how do we make an MDS useful for everyone? Um, it's unreasonable to expect um, care providers and families to contribute their data um, so that commissioners um, can plan their services better and researchers can have a fantastic data set to work for it has to be of value to everyone and I think it has to be transparently useful um, uh, across the world across the board and, and that again is another challenge. So in posing these questions I'm beginning to um, go back to Jenny's principles and I think I think we it, it's not unreasonable to go around in that circle because they are principles that are guiding our work and I think they are important questions um, so I'm going to leave it leave it there and uh, look forward to any questions and discussion hi um so thank you Barbara that's really useful and um, for me, I know from providers in domiciliary care that how complex it is, but also how they feel like they always get missed. They're always telling me how care homes get, I feel like care homes don't get enough attention, good attention, positive attention. And then domiciliary services say, well, try being domiciliary because we always get missed. So, and I think during the pandemic, they always felt like they were second in line too. So I think there's a bit of recovery work to be done there. But yeah, it's great. So um, finally, I'd like to introduce Anne-Marie. So she, she is a professor of social care at the University of Kent. 
and has focused on adult social care and quality of life measures. And she's passionate about translating research into practice, which is what hopefully everyone's all about. So she's going to be speaking about the quality of life measures. Thank you, Marlene. Hi, everybody. Um, have I shown, shared my screen correctly, Marlene? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so thanks everybody. I'm here to talk about quality of life, which if some of you know me won't be a surprise. It seems to be what I've spent the last sort of 20 years doing research on. So why is quality of life in care homes so important? Well, when I first started doing work in this area a long time ago, it was pretty niche, as uh, Claire mentioned at the start. I think Marlene introduced the DATCHA study more generally and said, this was an initially a, a very niche group of researchers doing this work around data in care homes. But equally speaking, I think when we first started looking at quality of life in social care, it was quite a niche thing. And, and certainly social care was dominated by health outcome measures rather than quality of life outcome measures. But what's really interesting, and I think particularly since COVID, is that there's been a notable shift. Um, and actually, the November, uh, there was a report published by the chief medical officer who clearly stated that maximising the quality of life of older people is now a national priority. As Barbara said, everyone agrees that uh, quality of life is really important, but very few are measuring it in a systematic way in care homes. And we know that from Barbara's survey. There's also no consensus on how to capture quality of life in care homes. And one of the challenges is making sure that the measures that we use are fit for purpose. And by that, I mean that they've been rigorously developed and tested in care homes with this population, measuring exactly what we expect them to measure. Another challenge is around conventional self-report. So as you will all know, I'm sure, is that if you complete a measure about your own quality of life, is they take the format of questionnaires, very often a question followed by some response options, and you tick a box indicating the option that best fits how you feel. What we know from previous research over the last sort of five years is that the, the needs of people living in care homes these days is such that actually very few can complete those questionnaires for themselves largely due to cognitive impairment, but also other things such as frailty, issues around communication. And so actually self-report, which is the gold standard way of capturing quality of life, is, is very challenging in those environments. So we need different methods to try and account for this. So what we did as part of the DATCHA study was begin by doing some consultations. So uh, in the first round of consultations, our priority really was to speak to different stakeholders who use care home data so um, or, or would need care home data. So these are people working in the care sector, um, policymakers, experts um, and family um, of people living in care homes, older people themselves, around what are the important things for quality of life measures to capture in care homes? So what are those kind of constructs of quality of life that we need to be capturing? And after um, gathering that information, we did some, um, we looked at the, the research evidence and we shortlisted some measures that we felt tapped into those constructs, which I'll say a bit more about in a minute. And then in the second round, we took those short, that sort of short list of quality of life measures to a wider group of stakeholders and gathered their opinions on those specific measures. And from that, we agreed a list of quality of life measures that we were going to pilot or try out within the DATCHA study. So those shortlisting criteria that we use were based on those principles that, were, that Claire outlined um, in the first presentation, but also drew on existing research evidence. There was a very uh, useful uh, systematic review of quality of life measures in care homes, I've referenced it there, that we used to inform the shortlisting process. Broadly speaking, this is a, obviously a very basic summary, but we were looking at measures that were suitable for care home residents. Have they been used in care homes before? Do they seem to work in that context? That were good quality, that work well as a scale. That's really important. It's quite technical, but it's really important. That they were short. So going back to that issue around data burden, one of the things we were really keen to make sure is that we weren't going to be asking people, care homes to complete very, very long measures that would be a, um, really not very feasible for them to complete and that they focused on outcomes, not processes. Oftentimes when we talk about quality of life, people think about quality of care. 
so they tend to talk about well as long as the staff are kind um and you know that the, the care is delivered when you need it um and the food's good quality now all of those things are absolutely important to people's quality of life but they're about the process of care the way it's delivered and the quality of care they're not about the, the end result so what we're interested is in the end result and um, how do people feel about all of those things are they meeting their needs so having gone through all that process, the quality of life constructs, the, the aspects of quality of life that we felt it was important to test in this context was a general measure of quality of life for older people. And for that, we're using the ice cap O. I'm going to show you these measures in a minute. Uh, a measure of social care related quality of life. So a measure that's specifically designed for people that are receiving social care. And for that, we piloted the ASCOT proxy. A measure of health related quality of life and for that we're using the EQ5D and um, a measure of dementia disease specific quality of life and for that we're using the QualiDem and this was all based on those consultations and that rigorous process. And I'll give you some examples and overviews of these scales because I'm aware that they've all got very strange names, um, abbreviations and many people may not be familiar with them. So this is the ice cap O. Um, and as you can see there in the reference, it was developed by Joanna Coast and colleagues. Um, and Ice Capo is a measure of older people's quality of life. So it wasn't developed with care home residents in mind, but more any person, any older adult could complete this measure. Um, it has one, two, three, four, five domains there um, of quality of life. And as you can see from this example, that it follows a basic pattern of uh, one domain, one question, and then the person will tick uh, one of four response options indicating how they feel with that aspect of their quality of life. So you can see these are very broad, they could be applicable to any one of us. Love and friendship, thinking about the future, doing things that make you feel valued, enjoyment and pleasure and independence. So that's gone into the MDS for piloting. The second one is the ASCOT measure, which was developed by us at the University of Kent. And it was a measure that was designed specifically to capture the impact of social care on people's quality of life. It has been used in care homes and in different social care settings. Um, it has eight domains of quality of life, ranging from what we call the basic. So things like food and drink, accommodation, cleanliness and comfort, personal cleanliness and comfort safety but also those higher order domains the things that kind of add quality to your life social participation occupation by which we mean meaningful engagement in activities um, control over daily life and finally dignity and respect and ascot has one question per domain similar to ice cap and they tick one of four response options so quite similar format but the difference is we have a specific measure that was designed to be completed by others on behalf of, for example, care home residents who couldn't self-complete. So you will see the format of this is slightly different to the ASCOT, to the ice cap, sorry. So you've got two, two columns there, and it means that if staff are completing this on behalf of residents, they can indicate how they feel, how they would judge the person's quality of life in that first column. But then the bit that we're really interested in, which is the second column, is how they think the person feels. Um, and that was developed through um, a series of studies that were looking at proxy response and how we can best um, ask people to represent the views of, of others who can't report for themselves. Finally, we've got a measure, or I should say thirdly, we've got a measure of health related quality of life. And this is the EQ5D. Now, unfortunately, due to licensing, we aren't actually allowed to show examples of the EQ5D proxy. It's developed by the Eurocoal group, but I can tell you that the domains that it covers. So it covers, it's a functional measure. So it covers the person's ability to perform activities such as mobility, self-care, perform their usual day-to-day -day activities, um, their pain and discomfort and their anxiety and depression. So as you can see, this is our health, health quality of life measure. And again, there are five response options for each of those domains that you tick a box for. And finally, our dementia measure that's gone into the minimum data set is the QualiDem. And as you can see from this, um, it's very long. So there are 40 items coded by staff on behalf of residents. It was designed for specifically for that purpose. So this makes this measure quite different to the others. It was designed with care homes in mind. 
um, and you can there are 40 items altogether covering those different constructs and rather than being one entire scale which all the others are this these are kind of a series of small scales um, defined by those different um, sort of subscales if you like those headings there was designed specifically for people with mild to severe dementia and staff will um, basically tick statements those 40 statements relating to those different constructs about how often they display those different types of behavior so that's also gone into the MDS and although it looks very long and that it's 40 items which might seem to work against our principles um, because of the way that the scale works in that it's just every single item is ticked never rarely sometimes frequently actually um, the evidence is that staff can complete these very quickly so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the emerging findings now, and I've put a little bit of a, a warning on here. We have only just started analysing this data, so you're getting really hot off the press findings. So although um, what I'm saying is hopefully, you know, is backed up by the evidence, there may be some slight changes as we look at this data in more detail over the next few months. So just a word of caution. So the data that we're drawing on here comes from the pilot, which was with 45 care homes and 996 residents consented to take part. And specifically, the bits that I'm going to be talking about today is, is it feasible to collect this quality of life data in care homes via staff? Um, and the reason we're going via staff is because, um, as I explained earlier, most care home residents can't self-report using these sorts of questionnaires. So we're interested in, do we get lots of missing data? Can staff complete it on behalf of residents? And we're also interested in what we call the validity of the scales in this context. Some of this is quite technical, but it's really important because we need to be confident that the scales are measuring what they intend to measure um, and that they work in this population. Um, so bear with me when I talk about some of this. We've tried to take a lot of the technical stuff out for today's webinar, um, but it's important because if we're going to use this data to inform policy or practice or direct care, then we have to be really confident that these measures are measuring what they're supposed to be measuring. I hope that makes sense. Um, we are going to be doing some more work around the usefulness of this quality of life data to other stakeholders, but that data is still being collected through focus groups and interviews um, with the care homes and the staff that took part. So I'm not going to touch on that today. So in terms of that feasibility question, um, it's really good. It's really promising. What we found was that although care homes didn't complete the measures for all of the residents that took part in the in the study, once they started completing the measures for residents, they did tend to finish them. So um, there's always going to be this problem when you do this as part of research is that you, you get all of these residents that consent to take part and you ask staff to then complete all this information about people and they don't get around to all of it basically. Or sometimes people drop out of the study midway through, they might go into hospital, some residents would have passed away. So we don't have that complete data for all residents. But the important thing, I think, is once that member of staff started to complete any of those quality of life scales, they were able to finish them. They were able to provide this information. And we know this because there was a, there was such a small amount of missing data once the data completion started. There were a few items within those scales that weren't as well completed. But even then, if you look at those percentages, they're very small. So in the proxy resident, the one where staff are putting themselves in the shoes of the resident and trying to answer on their behalf rather than give their own view as a member of staff. You can see there that they struggled slightly more with the dignity item, which is not surprising. So dignity in Ascot is measured by asking, you know, how does the way in which staff treat you make you feel? And so for some what we know is that sometimes staff can feel that that's a bit like marking their own homework because, you know, they're, they're, they feel a bit uncomfortable sometimes being a proxy for that particular domain. And as you can see, it's still very low missing data, only 7.3%. But some people may have not felt quite comfortable completing that. That's our guess as to why we had slightly higher levels of missing data there. Um, equally in the Quali Dem, interestingly, there were a couple of items there not being able to do anything. So rating how the resident might feel there and feeling worthless and again I note that these are items where 
it might be harder for staff to interpret how the resident's feeling. And that might be why we saw a slight increase in missing data there, is that if they weren't able to have a chat with the resident uh, before they completed these questionnaires, maybe they weren't quite confident um, in those particular items. Whereas you can imagine that some of the more functional items um, are easier for staff to observe and therefore to complete on the resident's behalf. So in terms of those kind of really technical psychometric evaluation, um, my, my colleague uh, Stacey Rand has been running this, this analysis, so I'm reporting on her behalf. There is evidence that scales are capturing the different elements of quality of life that they intend to measure in this population. So that's really good news. Um, and that the scales had the expected relationships with other scales. So this means that if you think about the concepts, that they're, the constructs that they're trying to, to measure that I talked about earlier, so general quality of life for older adults, health related quality of life, social care related quality of life and dementia, that they were that they are demonstrating the right relationships with other scales. So we're, we're quite confident that they are measuring what they're supposed to be measuring in this population. Um, in terms of how well the scales performed based on previous research, the EQ5D proxy, the ASCOT proxy resident and the ICE-CAPO all had good internal consistency, which means that if we look at previous research used in other populations, they you know, where these scales formed a whole, um, scale, they perform similarly with this population when completed by staff. So that's a really good positive. Um, the ASCOT proxy resident had a single factor structure, which is what we would expect. So that's really positive for that scale. But interestingly, the QualiDem scales did not seem to quite work structurally as we would expect from previous research. So when I introduced the measure, I said there were nine different subscales. We're not finding that in this initial analysis. So this needs some closer examination. We need to work out what's going on there because ironically, the QualiDem is the one scale that was designed absolutely for care staff to complete on behalf of residents with dementia. So it's quite interesting that, that that's the one where we're not quite getting the same um, structure within that scale. The other thing that we're finding, which isn't surprising with quality of life scales, is that we tend to get a cluster towards the top. So better quality of life um, and particularly for Ascot and Qualidem, that's not really surprising. Um, that would be typical of these sorts of scales because it can be a, a, an indicator that the, the care is meeting their needs in this area. Whereas you think about something like the Ice Capo, which is things like looking into the future, having you know loving relationships. These are broader concepts that are, that are less influenced directly by the quality of the care being delivered, maybe. Um, so you don't tend to see um, that their needs are being met so much. You get a bigger a variety of responses for those sorts of scales. So they're measuring different things, and that's important to, to note. So in terms of a summary um, of where we are with our thinking with these scales, we do feel on the basis of the data we've looked at so far that staff can complete these quality of life measures on behalf of residents. So that's a real positive. We found that most of the measures that we piloted had acceptable psychometric properties. But as I said, we need to look a bit more closely at the QualiDem. So excluding the QualiDem, um, there were more missing responses for the ASCOT proxy resident than there were for ICE-CAPO or EQ5D proxy. Um, we wonder if this is primarily due to the dignity question, which, as I said, looks about the impact of um, care, paid care on the person's sense of um, esteem and sense of self. So we know from previous research that this is already a more challenging question for proxies to complete. Um, but it is important to keep in there because it is important to people's social care related quality of life. So that's just something that we would need to think about in terms of how we might support people to complete this measure going forwards. As I said, the analysis is still underway, so these findings are tentative, so please bear that in mind if you if you want to share the slides with anybody um, that, that some of these findings may change over the next few months as we look more closely at the data. Thank you, everybody. And that's just to have the acknowledgement slide up there again. Thank you. I think I think from the beginning of the project or my involvement anyway, this has been a really interesting element because it, it's something that everybody pointed as a priority to be able to measure people's quality of life and it was something that hadn't been considered particularly before um, and so 
definitely like even for me it's influenced the way that we then started to work within the homes that I manage because we realized that it there's so much information so much deeper information that can be gained by knowing this so yeah and the, the other thing that's interesting with everybody involved in the study has been that there is some empathy and I'm sure Barbara knows from the domiciliary services too that these services are at capacity so like as in workload capacity so as researchers if you're going in and adding something to that a, another sort of thing for us to do then you also have to be prepared to take something away and even if that's not at the same time and it doesn't work at this in the same moment but you need to for us to be able to buy into something you're doing you have to be able to say we know this is extra work now in the future it will take this away and I think that that's really something that I've heard lots of people talk about but I, I think that understanding here is good around that so I'm gonna have a look and I'm gonna ask um some questions that are in the chat and then people might want to turn their camera on and um ask a few questions if if that's Okay, I'm sure that's fine. Um, so one of the questions that has been sent to me is that um, it says, curious to hear if there was any recording of sexuality and gender identified in home care. And that was to Barbara, because I think that was something that you didn't mention when you looked at the data collected. Yeah, thanks. And I think Vanessa's actually already addressed it in the oh. chat. So, so we we didn't actually um, ask in quite so much detail um, uh, in the home care, um, but it, it would be something that that we would consider in the future. So the answer is no. We don't have any information on that. Has anybody else got any questions they'd like to turn their camera on to ask? Or if there was any, I, I don't know if there's anybody from the team that wants to ask some questions. I think I think there are some questions about um, Interi in there earlier on. Yeah. Um, I don't know who's speaking, sorry. Oh, so that sorry. Was, that's Vanessa, isn't it? Vanessa, hi, no, it's just I'm checking the chat and I, I think there were some earlier questions about Interi. Um, what are the differences of MDS between the UK and US? Um, I mean, I can answer that. The, the um, so in minimum data set, there are two dominant ones that are used um, in America. Well, in the United States, it's called MDS three, and then in parts of large parts of Canada and in Hong Kong and in New Zealand and parts of Australia and some mainland European companies, there's uh, countries as Interay, which is the International Resident Assessment Instrument. And these are really detailed accounts of people who receive long term care. Um, they tend to only focus on people in care homes with nursing. There are other measures for what they call assisted facilities. Um, and developed mainly by geriatricians. So it tends to reflect a health um a health focus and that british Ger geriatric society um document discussed um and i think the link is in the chat discussed what they had achieved and so what they give is fantastic coverage and you can really understand the population well um i think one of the ch challenges that we took away from that meeting and vanessa and barbara were at it too was they employ people to complete the data in a lot of the care homes that it's actually a job to complete with the data set, which is sort of the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. And, and it and it assumes that you would only use this system. And the history in this country is that every time there's an innovation, it tends to get layered on top of an existing one. Nothing gets taken out. And when we started the Dacha study, we did ask people saying, OK, of all the data you've got, is there any data you don't really use and could do without? And none of our groups, you know, whoever was looking at care home data would admit to say, oh, no, no, we don't need that. That information could go. So in trying to go back to those principles, I think 
that is one of the big questions for things like the, stat, the minimum data sets in other countries. They're great. They're really good. They've had extensive development work, but it's a real struggle to understand how we would superimpose them on our existing approaches. And Barbara, you have a view on this as well, I think. Um, um, yes, I probably agree with you, actually. I think um, during the um, meeting uh, when the inter -I, um experts were talking, I was doing a back of the envelope sort of calculation of how many millions of hours of um, data collection staff we'd need if it was introduced in the UK. And I forget what it was, but it was a huge resource and just didn't feel like a realistic prospect for um, for the sector as it is at the moment here. So whilst we envy their the richness and the accuracy of their data, um, I personally feel it's um, a little discomfort at the fact it is very medical. Whilst it's a it's a lovely data set if you are medical, as I am, it's um, it's perhaps not entirely appropriate and tailored to the sort of personalised care that we should be thinking about providing in in home care and the care home settings. It's just a personal view. Neil, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for some great talks and it's, it's good to hear that work on uh, quality of life um, being piloted. Um, just coming back to that MDS point, I, I made a couple of comments in, in the chat. Um, there are two elements, I guess, in, in thinking of development of MDS in, in this country uh, that, that obviously we can learn from America, Canada and other jurisdictions. Well, one is obviously in the States that that assessment is used for uh, remuneration of, of nursing homes uh, based on level of care provided. Um, and I just wondered if there's any discussion or any um, thoughts of, of the future use of MD MDS in, in this country uh, to be part of payment mechanisms, i.e. For nursing homes providing a higher level of, of care for, for residents with, with higher needs, um, you know, paying accordingly. Or another aspect of looking at that is uh, looking at benchmarking and uh, again using uh, level of care, you know, case mix uh, in, in order to benchmark between different care homes and, and nursing homes. Thanks. Does anybody from the panel want to comment on that? Well, yeah, so that, that's very sensitive questions, aren't they, Neil? So, I, I mean, I, I think um, I think that goes back to um, Jenny's first, and it's such a shame Jenny isn't here to, to answer that because it, it goes to the heart of how do people use data. Um, so, yes, you're right about the mandate um, in the US um, is that, that it sort of drives the reimbursement um, and there's been some really interesting work because the nationally available data is also can be reanalyzed and and can begin to so with somebody like Charlene Harrington has been able to demonstrate the difference in outcomes on key measures for care homes that are for profit and those that are not for profit, which, as you can imagine, isn't particularly well received by the well the for profit homes didn't come out of it as good as the not for profit so um so i think the, the 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 mandate what we found in our realist review is that if you're going to implement a minimum data set you have to have a mandate people are not going to do this because they think it's good to have data but the realist review also showed which was drawing on implementation of minimum data sets in other countries because that was all we could go to for evidence was that if it is only about the reimbursement then it just becomes an admin data exercise um, and disassociated from oh look this is how we should be providing care um, and certainly the Canadians would say that the use of the minimum data set works best when it becomes the basis for conversation so when you have a visiting clinician people are looking at the same data together because it's meaningful for both the care home staff and for the visiting clinician and that's when it's transformative and similarly at federal level at state level when it there is a, it it facilitates an informed conversation i think the real worry is when it's used um, a little bit as you described to say well here's an underperforming care home so the canadians de demonstrated how 
chains could use the information extremely well to bring their own quality up. But of course, the question is then when it becomes something that is um, can be very uh, demoralizing. Um, so it, and I think the jury's a bit out on that uh, because you don't want to hide bad practice, but at the same time, you don't want people to be uh, criticized for things that are not necessarily bad practice as we've seen um, in other settings. Um, so yeah, and I was gonna say something else, but it's gone uh, from okay. my mind. Uh, yeah, Vanessa. Vanessa, do you wanna ask the next question? Um, no, it wasn't to ask, it was just a comment that, um that for example regarding home care that we have had conversations um with people like the home care association um who are very aware of inter and how it's used for reimbursement and are very much in favor of that kind of thing happening because they see it as a way to you know particularly um you know people with greater needs having um, yeah uh, basically a, a more stable and financially viable reimbursement regime um, but they're also in favour of it being used for sort of person-centred care uh, as well. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think yeah. if, Liz, if Liz Jones from the National Care Forum was on this call, she'd point out that at the moment um, the the policy seems to be moving towards punitive, not not reimbursement. But if you don't return mm -hmm. your data with the that um, you then will be penalised, um, uh, and she's fairly robust on that this isn't a way to work for the social care sector but uh, that's about as far as I'll go with talking on behalf no, of and for me the the important thing is what it what it will do for the people that we support and I think that's quite a motivation in itself for people that are managing services so like or uh, you know I, I just think I, I do understand the idea of mandating it and I work with services that reimburse us like skills for care reimburse us when we fill out their data set they they pay towards some of the training or you can claim back money towards the training but I think the the focus really needs to be on things like trying to save time make data available to us I you know it's only my own opinions but like benchmarks are really useful if we know where we compare to other services not particularly about those particular services but where it might identify areas we can improve on or um areas like you know that we can improve somebody's care on they're the things that are of benefit to us and marie there's a really interesting question in here about from liz liz graham i don't know if you want to turn your camera on and ask the question but i can say it if not yeah no i'm yep yeah. I've got my yeah. camera on. Yeah. So, so it yeah, I should I, should I answer? So yeah. yeah, yeah. So Liz has asked about whether the quality of life measures are measuring what's relevant to residents and whether staff reported difficulties complete the measures, even though the missing the missingness was good. And the answer to the second one is we're speaking to staff through focus groups and interviews now. So I can't really as I said, these are really emerging findings. I can't really talk to that now, but that's a really good question it's certainly one we're interested in finding out about and um, there are all kinds of reasons why there might be missing data and there are all kinds of um, other factors around how well staff found it how easy staff found it to complete and that may be to do with the software and the way the measures are completed not just the measures themselves so I think I have to be really careful about second guessing um, that but in terms of the measures and whether they capture what's important to residents. I think that was the whole sort of purpose of the consultation and also looking at the literature. So the shortlisting of these measures. And I think the thing to note is that most measures, including the ones that Barbara talked about earlier, the clinical measures, were not designed with care home residents in mind. They were designed for other purposes and have been adopted by care homes. And I think that's really important to note. So. You know, a lot of the clinical measures were designed for people you know, to use in hospitals or clinical settings and to be completed by someone other than a care staff, for example. Um, and the same goes for a lot of quality of life measures. So, you know, ICE CAPO was designed to capture the things that matter to older people about their quality of life. That's So that's where those domains come from. Um, EQ5D was designed to pick up the aspects of health that impact your quality of life. So that's where that comes from. Now, ASCOT, which is the measure we developed, so I know the most about, 
was designed to measure the impact of social care on people's quality of life. So we know that the domains do that. So, and they've been developed with people using social care as well as services. Um, now, I suspect that some of those domains absolutely would be the things that residents, in fact, I know from testing, that would be things that residents say were important. For example, control over daily life. So having choice and control, um, spending the occupation domain, how you spend your day, um, social participation, you know, seeing people that you like and want to spend time with, they are absolutely the things. But equally, some of those basic domains are critical, like food and drink, safety, because if you don't have those things in place, then the other things fall by the wayside, don't they? If you haven't got food and drink and you don't feel safe, it doesn't matter how socially engaged you are, you know, you need those other things. They're absolutely critical to life. So, yes, I think the answer to your question is I think the measures do probably between them capture the things that are important to residents. Um, but no one scale was designed for that purpose. And I think that's important because, you know, that's why we've done this exercise is to try and pilot and work out which scales work best in this context for residents and, and do the things that we want them to do. And that's why we're talking to staff about how easy or difficult it was to complete the measures. Um, so I hopefully by the end of the study, we'll be able to draw some firmer conclusions about what works and why. Um, but yeah, it's a really important question. There's another um, there's another question that says um, if the MDS is used to drive reimbursement, to what extent do you think they are inform that they are informing care planning, particularly person centred care planning? I can't speak for Interi, but I can speak for, for our MDS in that mm -hmm. I think a next stage of our work would be to start to look at how the measures that are being collected by care homes as part of the MDS are feeding directly into care planning. And we've started to do some of this with the quality of life measures. So my colleague, Nick Smith, um, is on, I think he was on him, I don't know if you're still here, Nick, but um, he's been doing some um, interviews with staff to try and understand both how they complete these quality of life measures for example and what they do with that information in terms of direct care so does it feed would is there scope for it to feed into care planning and certainly we're doing some work as part of the ascot um program internationally um to help care homes use quality of life data to create quality of life care plans so that if it, it wraps back up and becomes a useful for day-to-day -day practice rather than just measuring something for measurement's sake. Yeah, I think that's the interesting part because once you've identified there might be something that's, you know, there might be an area that they are, that we're failing in or, you know, not doing so well in or, you know, haven't approached yet, then it needs to trigger something. There needs to be some sort of red flag there that says, oh, actually, we need to concentrate on this element. And especially the importance of occupation for people, because when you ask people, when when I speak to residents directly, it's always, it, you know, like, they don't talk about their well-being in the same way you we use the term well-being. But what they talk about is occupation, entertainment, what to do. They're always the most important things. And, and the same in domiciliary services. It can be a very lonely, isolating environment sometimes being at home. And it might be the place that you want to be in most. Um, and at the same time, care homes can be very lonely and isolated too. Or they can give you a whole new lease of life where you build friendship and form connection. But occupation is something that I know is always very important to the people I support. I think there's a question there. Apologies if this has been covered. Can I check if next of kin or those with LPA for health may be best placed to complete the measures if they know that person well? Is it appropriate for them to do so? Shall I answer that? So, the, yes. That would be great. Um, I think it's important to recognise that when self-report isn't possible, which we know for most of residents it isn't, we've always we're always compromising. 
So either we exclude their voice altogether and don't try and capture quality of life at all, which is what's happening at the moment. And we saw during COVID, the impact of that was that we just had no data that we could take into account the impact of things like lockdowns. Although anecdotally, everybody was saying, you know, this is this is having this negative impact on people. And of course, on a one to one level, we all recognize that and know that there was no data that could go into modeling to inform you know whether some you know in things like infection control measures were adjusted for example to reduce the impact on people's quality of life in some way so we what we know that getting this data and getting it in a way that's suitable for analysis is really important then you've got this important question of who completes that data and for Dacha because we were trying to reduce the burden of data collection and, and we needed to link this data up we needed to have it embedded within the care planning software, which is why we went down the route of getting staff to complete it, just as they would for the other measures that Barbara was talking about. They'd make the rating of pain, they'd make the rate, you know, ratings of you know, skin and health and integrity and so on. So actually it made sense in the context of Dacha for it to be staff, but I do think that it would be really interesting to get family members in the future to do that we have done some work around that with ascot so with ascot we have looked at staff views family views um and also researchers going in in a kind of um almost in a cqc kind of style going in and collecting evidence and making ratings um using observations and things like that so we do know that that these different perspectives are different so if you the pattern that tends to happen with ascot i can't speak for the other measures this kind of work hasn't probably been done with a lot of the other measures but where you um if you were to look at those different perspectives you would tend to say that staff will tend to write rate people's quality of life slightly higher than the person might if they did it themselves mm -hmm. uh, but but family members often rate lower than the person would say themselves um so it's important to recognize that n in no cases are in either staff are doing the res ratings or residents or family are doing the ratings are they a straightforward replacement for what the resident would say for themselves they are different perspectives but they are trying to capture and give us an insight into people's lives that we would otherwise have totally missing thank you it's really, I, I think that's um interesting because even if we were if if we do that for ourselves and we ask two members of our family to rate our quality of life and we do it for ourselves or somebody, one of our colleagues fill that same form out for us, then we are going to have very different answers, aren't we? Because it's about what you allow somebody to know about yourself or to see about yourself. And so it's very interesting. Yeah. That, thank you for that. Is it possible just to make another comment around around that? Um, so, um my my role is I'm the care home support team lead um, within my area um, and we support care home staff um, with, with various different things. Um, <clears throat> and our trust uses um, I want great care for obtaining patient feedback. Um, however, 90% of our residents are severely cognitively impaired and are unable to, we are using um, the Mental Capacity Act very carefully to inform our practice um, and alongside that we need to consult with um, la anybody with lasting power of attorney um, when when they're making decisions around their health needs as well as the care home staff of course you know it, it's it comes all together but in terms of quality of life um, we very much go by observations of um, interventions so we we had a gentleman who, when we started, he was so fearful of his hand being managed in terms of hand hygiene. Um, so we've got, we I feel we've got a direct quality of life measure following our intervention because um, it took two hours for us to be able to even see the palm of his hand. But uh, we obviously pain manage with pain management medication, what have you, is being used. But it was his fearfulness of of this happening. Um, to cut a long story short, our outcome was um, he was laying out his arm upon the fact that we developed trust with him um, and he wasn't displaying pain and we were able to care for his hand. So in terms of quality of life, there were lots of issues there around reduced distress, re reduced pain, um, 
and um, a trust and, you know, and a contentment around when we were in enabling care. So that is a very kind of observational type quality of life measure there. It's not verbal. Um, and, you know, uh, obviously his daughter was thrilled with the outcome and and what have you. But it's much more complex than a verbal than verbal than conversations um, with with some people. Um, yeah, I I think that you're you're definitely right, and I've been in some of the conversations with the Dutch team around them really considering using different methods um, apart from the ones that they've already investigated. But yeah, I'm sure that's it. So so um, Gears, I think you've got something that you wanted five minutes at the end, quickly before we finish. It's been incredibly useful. Um, to me to listen to these conversations and these presentations. Um, but I think there might be a slide advertising like the next one. Have you got it, Giz? Yes, yes, I do. Thank you. Just two minutes would be enough. Okay, uh, perfect. Yes, can you see this? Yes. Perfect. Yes, so um, as part of the... Um, as part of the project, um, uh, as you heard from the previous uh, presentations, we developed uh, a minimum data set for care homes uh, over the past four years. And in this uh, Dutch, uh, in this event that we call consultations, we would like to look at, uh, since we brought this uh, content together of a minimum care home minimum data set, we would like to look at how usable and how relevant the content of the minimum data set is for different uh, user groups. And um, for this reason, we are setting up uh, some consultation groups, which will take place online, only one hour and a half long. And uh, there will be also a follow-up survey uh, in January or February. Um, when I say follow-up, it doesn't mean you have to attend both. You can do either or you can do both. And we were looking for volunteers uh, from this um, user groups who, who will be the future users of the MDS, uh, let's, let's put it this way. And if you belong to any of these groups, um, please uh, give us a shout. You can email me at this address here. I will also put it in the chat box uh, after this slide. And, and we will get in touch with you and uh, we will give you more details about online meetings that you can take part in. Uh, or the survey work that will be uh, held um, possibly early February and we'll be in touch with you. Uh, yes, so thanks thanks a lot um, for your interest in advance. Hope um, you, you were in, um, interested to hear all this um, uh, content about MDS today and hopefully you will get to see the content of the MDS that we create, we co-produced and uh, you can also have a say in it. Okay, Claire, I think that's everything. You're on mute there, we can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, for webinar by the means of mine. Um, yeah, thank you so much to everybody who have presented and thank you too to Jenny, who is uh, such a key member of this team and uh, who's prioritized uh, her patients, rightly so. Um, and uh, do keep in touch. We now have we did we announce at the beginning that the fourth and final webinar we've moved back um, into a later date, but we'll be circulating that. That was just to do justice to the analysis um, of how we've achieved the data linkage. So we will be letting you know if you've registered already for the fourth webinar, you'll be getting a personal communication and then watch the new year for the adverts for the final one but and if you want any more information about Dacha do get in touch with us personally we will respond and also um, do look at our website as well so thank you very much and thank you to Marlene great job thank you